专题演讲，邀请主持人摩克斯分项计划召集人刘安之教授。刘教授，请。呃，这个大家早哈 ，Good morning。呃 ，Yesterday we spent a whole day in the、uh, focus mode. And、uh, last last evening we pretty much in the、uh, diffuse mode, right? So、uh, today we come back.、Uh, we're gonna go be again in the, another、uh, focus mode. So uh, uh, today, say、uh, the concentration for to, to for us to focus will be、uh, <coughs> Barbara's、uh, experience in the、uh, for the basement studio. How I, I believe those are the the the. The, the the tricks or or the, the the way how you would do do the moves by yourself, you know, re, rather than in the、uh, official,、uh, you know, <coughs> the, the the studio. But、uh, so, without further、uh, delay, and I think I will just ask Professor Oakley to、uh, give the talk. Yeah, welcome. Okay. So,、uh, so another exciting adventure today.、Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit. What I want to do is try to share every little tiny bit of information I have to help you to make better MOOCs. And so, what we're going to cover today is we'll talk first about what I call the mantra, sort of the main idea to always keep in mind with your teaching, and then we'll talk about script. And how you formulate a script. We'll talk about the actual videotaping, the editing process. We'll talk about funny stuff and、uh, quizzing. And finally, we'll wrap up with a big picture overview of MOOC creation. So, first off, there's the mantra. And one thing that I've found over the years is we all, when we become professors. We become professors because we've been very successful at showing off how much we know, and that becomes this kind of way of looking at things、uh, that that we we teach by kind of showing everything and its full complexity and then breaking it down for people. But actually, that that can intimidate people. It can impress them with your knowledge, but it's intimidating for students. If you present things initially as this is really pretty simple, it's actually easy stuff, and you can come on board with me, and you do this online, people will want to climb on board with you. They'll get excited about it. So you always want to present things as, hey, this is really simpler than you might think, instead of this is very complex, but I will show it to you, right? So the the First thing I'll talk about is creation of a MOOC script. So we we described yesterday that、uh, about six minutes or so, research has shown that、uh, people drop off on either side of a six-minute time frame, and you can see why that is. If somebody's sitting and they're thinking about, should I watch the next video, or should I go have a snack? If it's six minutes. Yeah, they'll do it, but if it's 20 minutes or a half an hour or an hour, well, then they'll put it off. And as you know, procrastination can be really、uh, a very significant factor. So you want to avoid procrastination by breaking things down into small chunks as much as you can. Now, there's when you're MOOC making, there's sort of two ways to do MOOCs. One is And this is what Coursera recommends.、Uh, they they recommend that you film, you you create a set of objectives. You might show those objectives on the teleprompter, and a good instructor would look at the objectives and kind of go, "Oh yeah, I'm supposed to say this, this, and they'll kind of it'll just help them keep in mind the points they're supposed to make during their talk." So that's one way of doing things. For For some people, that works very well. Some people speak extemporaneously very well, and if they have to speak from a teleprompter, they look just like they're reading, just like this, right? And 
So some people don't read very well from a teleprompter. But for me, um, I like working from a teleprompter. I, I am very cognizant of the fact that every second counts, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but everything I say is going to be uh, concise, precise, and, and exactly what people need, and I feel that the best way for me to do that is to read from a script. I think that anyone can naturally acquire the ability to look natural in reading a script. It, the first time I ever got in front of a, a camera, I looked like a deer in the headlights. I was so terrified. And, but the thing is, that's very normal uh, to, to look really petrified and look not very natural. After a, a little bit of practice, you'll find that it becomes much more natural. After a while, you just get sick of it, and you're just like, okay, well, so what? The camera is right there. So, uh, so, so it can become much easier. This, um, this gentleman here is my better half, uh, my husband, and is, he's in a very, he's in a typical pose. Uh, I don't know why he added those clips. He decided to uh, look more, I don't know, business-like or something. Uh, but he, that's the teleprompter there, and he's probably about to say something like, okay, Barb, quit being a diva, get your backside in here and you know, hit this mark and let's get this done so we can go to lunch. Uh, but he, um, so you can see it's in our basement, there's our uh, exercise equipment right behind him. And what I would often do is just read from the teleprompter. So one thing though is be aware that when you are reading from a teleprompter, you're reading if it's very close, you can see the eyes move. So your tendency is to want to get it very close so you can see the teleprompter easily. But the further away you can get it, the less obvious it becomes that you're reading from a teleprompter. So I, we always put it well back. Sometimes I almost would want to squint to try and see what it was saying. But, uh, but then people would say, how did you remember all of that? And I'm like, oh, I didn't remember all of that. I, it, it's all scripted. So uh, this is not to be read, actually. It's just an example of a typical script. So yeah, roughly around 500 words is maybe uh, four or five minutes uh, of talking. I tend to speak a little more slowly. I had to s try and speed up my pace um, even so, I probably could have spoken even more quickly. Uh, then, when you're writing the script, so you can see my script is right here, and I have little notes to myself, like, oh, I want to remember and have a full body shot right here. Uh, at this point, I'm, I'm pointing to the left. I'm pointing to the right. Uh, but what, what I'm really doing is, as I'm writing the script, I have in mind, oh yeah, I'm gonna put this picture here. And I know it's gonna be right about here and it's gonna to relate to something. Sometimes I don't even exactly know what the picture is going to be, but I know roughly that there's gonna be a picture there and I should probably point like that. So as I'm writing the scripts, I, I, I develop what, what I'm going to uh, be pointing to or talking about. And we would always do it so that we would film twice. But now there's 4K cameras that have much higher pixel density, and so you, don't, you, can, only, you can film just once and it'll work just fine. But we would film half, one time a read through where I'd, I'd be half body, and one time a read through where I'd be full body. I don't know why, but full body, I always would be more nervous. Right, uh, um, uh, part of it, I think the camera would be further back, and it was a little harder for me to read. Uh, but uh, but I would always the reason for that is because when you're standing full body, uh, that gives you the capability of going from standing. Well, first off, when you're standing, you can appear to be almost walking around in whatever you're pointing to. And as we discussed yesterday, that gives you the possibility of 
making it look like you're walking into the metaphor or the illustration that you're trying to uh, demonstrate. And that makes it so much more graspable and real to the people who are watching. But the other thing that full body does is you can go from full body to half body and that gives the visual illusion that you've just jumped forward. And that tricks the brain into paying attention because looming motion is something that could kill you, right? I mean, on an evolutionary perspective. So when, when objects appear to be jumping closer to you, it activates all sorts of levels of neural mechanisms and grabs your attention. Have you ever noticed like, I don't know, do you have spiders here in Taiwan? So you have a spider here and it moves really quickly towards you. Uh, and it, sometimes they look like boom, 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 they're real, and it gets your attention. So, and that is that, that neural mechanism of looming motion that, that activates. Also, when you simply move, uh, for example, if you're in a restaurant and you want to attract the attention of your friends, you wave your hand. Motion is what, it, it isn't just the visual aspect, it's the moving aspect that's what attracts your friend's attention. So what you want to do is always have motion to integrate it into your videos. You never want to have a talking head, which is very predictable, just sitting there and then a few bullet points coming up and then a picture and then the talking head always on one side. You want to have, you want to have the, the body and uh, you know, as much as possible vary things. Have, have it be a little unpredictable, have lots of motion. When, you're, when you might be watching television, start watching what uh, television editors do they, to keep your attention, they will never have a scene where it's too static for too long. So uh, this, uh, if you start watching these kinds of things, you'll start integrating that kind of activity into your MOOCs and it'll actually be better. Now, Steve Jobs was, he, he what he did was he, if you're of a certain age, you'll remember when computers, you would open them up and it would take several minutes for the computer to boot up. Well, Steve Jobs changed all that. He just said to his engineers, I don't care if it's impossible, you will make it so that when you open your computer, it instantly boots up. Because uh, think of all the thousands of wasted, I mean millions and millions of wasted minutes from people worldwide opening their computers and just sitting around waiting while they boot up. Similarly, when I'm MOOC making, I'm trying to make sure that every single second counts. Now this is not to say that I, I'm going really fast, it's just that everything I do is precisely thought out so that there isn't a wasted second. And when students are tuning into one of my videos, they know that they're gonna get the straight information, practically, uh, you know, practical information without kind of sort of any wasted time. If they have, if there is a tendency to waste time and have some ums and ahs and so forth, people tune out, right? They'll, they'll, they'll just remember the MOOC world is highly competitive. And so if you want to do a good MOOC, you want to make sure that you're very cognizant of people's time. So uh, for that matter, tight scripting is very important. And this again is where I like to script. And so uh, here's an email from someone who says, if I were to give one tip for the benefit of non-native English speakers, it would be helpful if scripts were revised and to reduce and eliminate superfluous words and phrases. There's probably a few superfluous words and phrases in there. But anyway, you get the idea, which I think is a very good one. Tighten it up. When I write a script, I put it away, and then I look at it fresh a, f a few days later so that I can uh, um, edit, make it. Sometimes when I'm writing, here's, how, well, here's what happens. First it comes out, I'm, I'm a trained professor. I'm an academic, right? So it comes out in 
terrible professor language, very pedantic. Nobody would ever want to read it. So I, but I just let it flow out naturally in this horrible, pedantic speech. Then, once I've got it out, I revise it into something that would actually be more like a normal human being would say. Sometimes what you'll see is professors either extemporaneously speak in a very pedantic way, or they have scripts that they've never revised to make more make it seem like they're actual human beings uh, who are speaking it instead of pedantic people. So, um, so just be very aware. As much as possible, you want to be just normal human, uh, as if you're speaking with someone in an ordinary tone of voice, not being very high uh, professor sort of pedantic person. So one thing I recommend is to use, so I, I write a lot of nonfiction, and I've found that uh, using tricks from nonfiction is very, very helpful. So one thing is when you read great nonfiction, it's, it isn't just about the material. It has lots of verbal surprises, a real richness and depth to it. So, uh, in other words, you, you have a lot of metaphor, and I'll give an example of that. But you also want to have a hook and tell a story with what you're doing. If you can begin with anything that sort of motivates students to, what, what, are, what is he or she talking about? Why should I look further or listen further? If, if you can start a, a lecture with these kinds of things or something exciting, uh, it will make them so that they they always kind of enjoy watching your videos. I mentioned before that idea that top professors worldwide seem to share this ability, particularly in the difficult math and science uh, and engineering topics, of using metaphors and analogies to convey good ideas or, or difficult and complex ideas, and those. Uh, remember, use the same neural circuits that you use, so you use for metaphor the na same neural circuit that you would use to understand the difficult topic that you're, you're trying to really explain through that met metaphor. So uh, metaphor and analogy are incredibly important. I just have to give an example of one of my favorite writers in the English language, which is uh, Laura, Laura Hillenbrandt. And she wrote a book called Sea Biscuit, which is very, uh, it was a big bestseller in the US. And I just have to read, I, I opened the book at random. Look, listen, as I read this, all of the metaphors she uses to convey the ideas. She says, to pilot a racehorse is to ride a half ton catapult. Ah, nice metaphor. It is without question one of the most formidable speed, uh, feats in sport. Jockeys squat on the pitching backs of their mounts, a task much like perching on the grill of a car while it speeds down a twisting pothole freeway in traffic. So that's great writing. And well, maybe we're not all Laura Hillenbrands, but we can script in some nice imagery and metaphors in whatever we're, uh, we're MOOC making about. And I don't care if you're talking about computer science or uh, thermodynamics or you name it, uh, there, there's ways to script in some. And what this does is it also allows for, for really interesting visuals. So let's move on to the videotaping. I, I had shown you uh, the picture of my clean basement so uh, that from yesterday. The thing I liked about doing the videos in the basement is that it, I had total control over the video process. So if I didn't like it, I didn't have to go, oh man, I gotta schedule <clears throat> another session and, um, and see if I can you know, reshoot these videos. I could just do it, you know, and, and, or if I took a longer time and I wanted to do it a couple of times, there was no problem with that. So it worked out very well. So here is, uh, you saw this video yesterday, but what I want to point out
is a couple things. Look at how I'm using my hands to gesticulate. When I'm moving my hands, my, your mirror neurons are firing. So if I'm going like this, your mirror non neurons are, are indicating that your hands are doing exactly the same thing, and that can help you understand whatever I'm talking about. So uh, also notice the simple background that I use. So um, for example, here you can see, I just use a, a sort of a plain Jane um, PowerPoint background. And people often have commented to me that they've really liked these simple backgrounds. If you look, a lot of MOOCs, what they tend to do is they'll have a bunch of books on a bookshelf behind the professor. And you don't realize it, but th that becomes really boring, very predictable, and it's also kind of busy. It, it has nothing to do with what you're trying to teach. So, uh, so be cognizant of whatever background you're using. And simple is, people really seem to prefer simple. Because I never would have expected I'd get so many emails from people saying, you know, I really like your simple background. I mean, it never occurred to me. So uh, as I mentioned before, either use a 4K camera, a high pixel density uh, camera, or film twice. You can see here I had half body and then full body because, well, at that time we didn't have a, a really good camera. And, and then what I could do is I could edit back and forth. So um, sometimes what I do is I would make a mistake. And so then to cover up, I would jump to, you know, from full body maybe to half body. So it looked like I just chose to do that as an editor. But actually it was, oh no, I, I, I messed up right there. And so I, I jumped to the other one because it looked better. So, and then sometimes when I'd shoot, um, sometimes you just look more dynamic. And so having a couple of shoots gave me more options to choose from. On the other hand, it can really make the editing process a little longer, so you don't want to shoot too many times. Now, um, a few, Additional tips and tricks for green screen. Remember, if you don't know green screen, you've never done anything with green screen, it's totally simple. You just Google it up, and, uh, and whatever software you're using, just, just uh, they'll always have little videos that walk you through how to do green screen, and it's, it's very easy to do. So you want, the one thing you do is when you're filming in green screen, you want to use a, a higher shutter speed. And what that does is, when you're moving your hands in green screen, for some reason, like if I go like this, I'm pointed to something, if you look between the fingers, it will have these little green blurs. So the way to eliminate that is, first off you have a little extra lighting with green screen. That will allow you to make it so you've got a, a higher shutter speed. And, is, and then uh, just having that higher shutter speed with the extra light will make it so that when you're moving your hands, you won't get that weird little green blur and you won't get that weird little halo. Uh, um, and also be very careful about how you focus when you're green screen. A focus matters more for green screen. So what you want to do is set your focus as good as you can. And then once you've done that, then put, it, put your camera on magnify and go look at the corner of someone's eyes, of the, the talent, we call it the talent. Look at the corners of their eyes. There are usually is a, you know, a few little cracks or crevices there. So focus in, get a really good focus on that little crack at the edge of the eye, and then you can pop the, pop the magnification out, and you've got perfect focus, which is uh, more important for green screen. So um, uh, let's see. W another thing is be aware that you want to, if you walk away for half an hour or an hour, when you come back, recheck that focus. It drifts off 
even just a little bit, and it can really affect the green screen. So always be aware of the, what the focus is. Now, there's also one more little trick. And this one took me a while to figure out. So I'm trying to share all of my mistakes. So if when you mic yourself up or you're mic'd up, then you'll have, uh, what I would do is I'd have a microphone coming up and I would hook it right into my collar and then what I'd find is there'd be this noise that I'd pick up, this kind of like, uh, like, a, like something was rubbing somewhere and I was, it, I, it was driving me crazy because it's really hard to edit out. And you'll, see, you'll hear it a little bit on some of the videos, even though I worked really hard. I mean, it was worse before I tried editing. But if you make a little loop and clip it, uh, so with the wire, make a little loop as you clip it. What that does is it relieves the mechanical tension on your microphone. So, the, and what's happening is your microphone is rubbing a little on your shirt. And so if you relieve the mechanical tension by just having a little loop there, it will save all this noise. If you're a woman, stand like this, and you'll look a little more svelte, right? Don't whirl, wear pearls if you're, uh, because they will maybe click against something and, and create these weird little noises. Uh, if, again, if you're a woman, don't wear a white bra, wear a beige bra, because it will show through, uh, the white somehow will show through um, where a beige bra will not. So um, another thing is, I, and I should have written these things down, but they're just coming to me, but if you're a female, you want to try and lower the pitch of your voice. Great. Um, newscasters who are female uh, and also politicians, for example, Margaret Thatcher, took elocution and, and voice lessons to lower the pitch of their voice because a higher voice tends to get squeaky and it can be irritating for people. So, uh, so you want to consciously work to speak at a, a little bit of a lower register if you're a female, uh, just because it, it's more pleasant for, for people to listen to. There's a reason that like Christian Amanpour, the, the famous female broadcaster, she has sort of a deep voice and that's part of why she's popular. It, it's, it's somehow more pleasant to listen to than a, a higher kind of squeaky voice. So, um, so there it is.